The gospel that is read for the feast of St. Joachim is a gospel, let's just say it's a gospel based on tradition. It's an important tradition. It, we, it's able for, the, for Jesus Christ to trace his lineage back through all these various ones, these important personages of the Old Testament, back to the point of King David. Um, many um, prophecies had been made regarding the Messiah to come, and one that had been frequently made and needed to be observed was that he was the descendant from the house of David. And so the reading of this particular gospel for today, for the Feast of St. Joachim, even though St. Matthew's outlining of this is for Joseph, St. Joseph, and his following that he is of the house of David, it is of tradition that Joachim and Anna were also of the house of David and traced their lineage the same way, so that Joseph and Mary were both of the house of David, and in that way directly, since Jesus took his humanity from Mary, then he would be truly of the house of David and fulfill that important part of prophecy. Yesterday, if you were at Mass yesterday here, and um, we were reflecting upon the Feast of the Assumption and the Dogma of the Assumption and saying that the Dogma of the Assumption is largely given to us because of tradition, the uninterrupted tradition that has come down from the time of the Apostles to our time now, and that Pope Pius XII, when he established this as a dogma of our faith, did it mostly. Uh, for the 90% of it or better, on tradition and the keeping of that tradition, the teachings of the fathers and doctors of the church. Through that understanding, then the traditions of the church are so important. Here we come to the Feast of St. Joachim, and we're coming to that particular point again, that traditions of the church are important because they make up a good understanding of our observance of this feast, not just the generations, if you will, of Jesus Christ, that he's of the house of David and make sure that that's observed, because that's an important tradition that the Jews had to identify the Messiah, but also because of tradition that will come to us of the life of St. Joachim. St. Joachim has been given to us in our time as an important personage for us to have um, at least a recognition of. As I'd mentioned just as Mass began, um, under Pope Leo XIII, whose first name and a secular name was Joachim, um, and it just shows you if you're a pope, you can kind of move things along here and bring up some kinds of things that come along that way. It's not an abuse, it's just he had a great devotion at St. Joachim, and the Holy Ghost inspired him, it sure seems, in the liturgy to bring the Feast of St. Joachim to such a rank that if we are gathered together in church on August 16th, that the Mass that we would have and the devotions we would pray and the virtues that we try to imitate would come from St. Joachim and not necessarily the Sunday after Pentecost where it came from. So we see in this particular time then, St. Joachim is given to us, it seems, just by seeing the way the Holy Ghost is working the church at that particular point, it seems that St. Joachim is given to us because there are virtues there for us to practice. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the Feast of St. Anne. We saw in her particular feast day there another part of this tradition. That's the only way that we know her life. We don't know of her life through any other source than but from tradition, a tradition that had been well established in early Christianity one of the Jerusalem traditions that I often talk about. This tradition has kept itself faithfully coming from the time of the apostles all the way down to present time, showing the importance of devotion to St. Anne, but also to St. Joachim. At that time, when we reflected upon um, St. Anne's feast day and the difficulties that she went through before she became the mother of the mother of God, um, the ridicule that she went through, the gossip that she had to endure from people, because at her, at her older age, being a daughter of the house of, of King David, not having a child, because all the women of the house of David wanted to have children, because possibly, maybe, that child would be the Messiah. And for here is now a daughter of the house of David, and having no child, so there must be a reason for it, must be some great shame that had come upon her, and all these gossipers would come up with all these reasons, which they think why it is that Anne, and then maybe Joachim, have sinned, and that's why God has not blessed them. It brought great hardship upon them in their life. That's all part of that great tradition of what had happened under St. Anne. Well, there's this radio personality out there right now that has these programs on, at least during the weekdays, and he tells you at some particular point after starting the story, he says, and now the rest of the story? Well, that's what we're going to go into today, the rest of that story. Because St. Joachim, it's an important part here. Again, we learn this from tradition. 
We know very little of anything about the early part of St. Joachim's life, nor when he died. We just have this one snippet of it that regards the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What we understand here from St. Joachim, what tradition tells us about it, is that he was a wealthy man, um, great honor and great wealth. He took care of, he had flocks and herds and you know, lands and, and animals and things like that. So he had wealth, but he used that wealth to take care of the poor. We read that in the prayers of the Mass today. Because he took care of the poor and he assisted them in every way that he could. And so in that way, God blessed him at some particular point. But it came to this point, even in his age, in his older age, he had not yet been blessed with a child. And it was, you know, again, externally shameful, especially for those who were gossipers out there and wanted to penetrate and for them to think they can take the place of God and figure out what God is doing and why in this person's life. That's how gossipers act. Anyway, Joachim went one day up to the temple in Jerusalem to offer sacrifice. And as so many times his purpose for offering sacrifice was for this, that he could have a child, that his family with him and Anna could be blessed with having a child. It's part of a story that's and it's an interesting thing, you know, how it happens here, but tradition bears this up. St. Joachim brought one of the animals from his own herd. He had brought it all the way here to offer it up in sacrifice. He got right to the altar to offer the animal up in sacrifice, and the, the priest who was there taking the sacrifices refused it. Refused to take the sacrifice, would not let him offer sacrifice. Had to let him leave in humiliation, even take his animal with him. Why? Because everybody knows you are cursed from God. Gosh, this gossip has gone around so terribly. It has ruined the reputation in so great a way. It has shamed such a good man, a good man in the eyes of God. But these gossipers took the place of God and even affected the things that the priests did. So anyway, here's Joachim going away in humiliation, leaving to go back to his place. He's so humiliated in this, he doesn't understand what God is doing. He still trusts in God, but he doesn't understand what God is doing here and not accepting his sacrifice. But he does not want his wife to share in that shame, so he does not go home. He, he loves his wife too much. He will not have her endure the very things. He doesn't even want to talk to her about it because it would make her be hurt even more. So he goes off to some area farther in his lands to take care of the animals and to pray. And on her part, finds out that Joachim will not come home and this is the reason why. She puts on mourning garments as if someone in her household is dead. She prays to God to find out what is it, why is it we cannot have a child. If there's something wrong, please show us, dear Lord, and we will correct. Joseph Joachim is off in his part mourning and praying. Anne is doing the same thing in her house, but this time with her mourning garments on. And everybody else is on the outside, on the outside saying, gee, you've been seeing her son, your father, or rather, her husband even left her. He can't stand to be around her, and so these little gossipers continue to gossip around, as they always do. Well, God did answer their prayers, but in a way they didn't expect. The angel Gabriel first came to Anne, it's part of her story, came to her and said, you will have a child. And that you will know it's from God, I want you to go to the Golden Gate, one of the gates that are there and in the city of Jerusalem, and just and go there. Beyond anything else, the angel didn't say anything else there, just go there. And so she took off her mourning garments, put on fresh, clean clothes like she was in time of celebration, walked through the streets of Jerusalem and head for the Golden Gates. And boy, that got the gossipers going. Boy, who does she think she is? One thing she's mourning, but now look at her. She's all enjoyment. What's going on with her? All the gossipers kept going here and tearing her down. St. Joachim is out there taking care of his flocks in prayer to Almighty God. The angel Gabriel appears to him too. If you're not Joachim, you will bear a child, and this child shall be great before God, so that you will know this child is from God to you as a gift in a special way, in a work of God, in a special manner. Such it has been in the, in the choice of God to have you have this child at this old age. And at one point you will return your child to God as the gift that she is to you, that she will be to you. The angel tells uh, Joachim to rise up, to cease his mourning, 
and to go to the golden gate. Doesn't say anything else beyond that. Go to the golden gate. So here's Anna coming through the city, heading for the golden gate. And here's Joachim coming from outside the city, up the road, heading to the golden gate. And they both meet there at the golden gate. And they're both, both joyful and peaceful in spirit. They both know that the angel Gabriel has appeared one to the other and given this great message. And it's a joy that cannot be contained. They both return to their house that is there in the city of Jerusalem. They return to their house. It's flabbergasted, the gossipers. Gosh, they can't understand. Now both of them are happy. They're supposed to have been cursed by God, but now they're both happy. And then within a period of time, that even in her elder age, Anna conceives a child and brings her forth and names her Mary. Later on, in an early age of life, they know, according to the angel had told Joachim, that um, this would be to prove that it is a gift from God and you must return this gift back to him. And so, when she was in a very early age, they took her to the temple and presented it to our Lord so that she'd begin her life in the temple. They sacrificed even that part of having their child grow up in front of them so that they could fulfill what it is that God had given to them. God gave them the great gift of having a child, and they would return that gift back to God in such an important and wonderful manner. That's all we know from tradition about St. Anne and St. Joachim. Just that. But it's enough. There's enough in there for us to find many virtues for us to imitate. And I'm going to propose some of these virtues I'm going to talk about today to men in the parish. For a few weeks ago, I wasn't here at the Feast of St. Anne. I was in, in Massachusetts and had Mass there and proposed to the people there and talked to the women of the parish about St. Anne, the virtues we promised. And I know St. Father Cossack was here and he did so much the same thing. I'd like to speak more to the men about the manly virtues here we see in St. Joachim, a man of prayer, but even though he's a man of prayer, he is a man, a man with manly virtues and points to be imitated. And I think some of the very stories in the early time of Christianity, the edifying stories about Joachim and St. Anne, that everyone would know these are the parents of Mary, these are the grandparents of Jesus Christ. The stories of them would be revered among them. The actions that they had done would be imitated and for men, St. Joachim will be upheld in his understanding, especially in this, let's take the one virtue, the first virtue I want to talk about here. How St. Joachim looked to the devotion he would have, the love he would have for his wife. I'll call it devotion because it was that particular way. In the Old Testament times, in the Jewish law, the ways of marriage, the fidelity in marriage, the permanency of marriage is not the same, was not the same as we see in Christianity with the, the sacrament of matrimony as Jesus Christ gave it to us. Amen, amen, I said, our Lord said there. He had changed things. You heard Moses had told you this before, but I tell you now. Things were changed for Christian matrimony. But Joachim and Anna were already living those changes, if you will. Even though they did not live under the gospel, we still call them saints because their lives were so intimately connected right now with the work of redemption, and they were already living the Christian spirit, even before Christ even began teaching and preaching the gospel. And the Christian spirit, first of all, or greatly that influenced so many people, was regarding marriage. If you read the, the epistles of St. Paul, or even follow the Acts of the Apostles, or read a good life on the life of St. Paul, you'll find out that one of the things that attracted most people to his preaching was when he spoke upon the Christian viewpoint toward marriage. He would talk about the risen Christ. He would talk about other virtues that were important here. But every time he got on the subject of marriage, crowds came to him. And these would even be the pagans because they didn't understand marriage that way. The respect, the love of husband for wife. The devotion wife would have toward husband. They didn't even expect that particular thing. They would, they, it was foreign to them and even to the Jews. But St. Paul spoke with such conviction such love for this understanding to help people to understand this is how God wants us to establish and understand marriage now. To the Ephesians, he wrote, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it, that he might sanctify it and cleansing it by labor of water and the word of life, 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So also ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, as also Christ does to the church, because we are members of him, both of flesh and his bones. St. Paul is presenting here for something for men, a love to be demonstrated toward wives in the same way that Christ loved the church that he established, sacrificing himself for it, being member for member, a part of that church, the understanding of the whole mystical body of Christ, that there is that respect and love in every way that must be given, even to the point of sacrificing, sacrificing, coming away from that personal independence and way of life, sacrificing for that life together. Okay, for the women, this is probably a part, part that we're not ready to go along with, but St. Paul's also is teaching in Ephesians. I remember so many times in having marriages for some people, some, some of the women would say, okay, Father, you're going to read that one part that St. Paul says about wives, you've got to obey your husband? Yeah, because it's part of the gospel teaching. But it has to be understood correctly. Marriage is not a dictatorial thing. The husband is not a dictator. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Where is there dictatorial things in there? It's nowhere to be found. St. Paul, when he speaks of this, of the love wives should have for their husbands, begins it this way, being subject to one another in the fear and reverence of Christ. Subject to one another. Encouraging one another. Helping, assisting one another especially in assisting in the things necessary for salvation. Be subject to one another. I mean, wait a minute. He's saying, you know, <laughs> he's going to say in just a few minutes here, let women be subject to their husbands as to the Lord. But yet we're supposed to be subject to one another. You know, just where do I reconcile that? Well, it comes to the point of saying every organization has to have somebody in charge who will make the decision. But at the same time, Marriage is not just some organization. The husband's not just the CEO of some organization with children and a wife there and taking care of a home. He's been appointed by God to watch over, to care, to love, to cherish. But he's also at that particular point having to make some decisions, but the decisions are not going to be so oligarchical, as the term would be, so dictatorial, so saying, I am so gifted with everything that the wife can never offer suggestion, can never be, bring up any particular point, be subject one to another in the fear of Christ. St. Paul says first before he gets to this point, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of his body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so also let wives be to their husbands in all things. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and this shall be two in one flesh. You know, we're coming in a point right here with St. Paul's teaching, even though he's saying about his obedience and all these things that are there. There's a unity, a unity that's supposed to be there between husband and wife that has no fear of dictatorial things, that has no fear of following along the pathway of God of what marriage is supposed to be. So it's a unity of purpose, a unity of mind, and unity of heart. And if it comes to a point, an important decision needs to be made, then the husband makes that because he loves his wife as Christ would love the church. And he understands that responsibility. These are the things, you know, just an important teaching. And I'm just, you know, getting in just a small way, but this is the way of Christian marriage, the Christian idea toward marriage and the relationship of husband and wife. And just a little snippet we've seen in the life of St. Joachim and of St. Anne show that, that they lived that and became great saints. Another virtue for us to see in the life of St. Joachim is that he had a trust in God, a prayerful life. I can't tell you how many times in the course of my priesthood that I've come across people who will, you know, come, Father, I need an appointment with you, i got to go talk about it. I've got some problems and difficulties and all these things, and that's fine. We will sit and begin talking about the various things that have to be troubling that person, maybe in body or soul, whatever it might be. But not too long into the conversation, there's a question I always have to ask. Have you prayed? The great trials and difficulties that come up in life, 
finances, job, whatever. 99% of the time, anyone afflicted in that particular way, the first thing they stop doing is praying. The first thing they do. They think they have to take this whole burden upon themselves. And as a result of that, there is no grace to help them see the pathway out of that difficulty from acceptance to showing what can I do right now. They muddle around in their own life. Oh, woe is me. Oh, I can't, oh, I just think I can't sleep. I can't eat. I've got all these problems here. And they're making them worse and worse and worse because they do not pray. And when you remind somebody of that, they go, oh, yeah, maybe I should have prayed. Oh, wow. And they start praying. Gosh, the, there, there is sun out there. I found the tunnel and there is light there. Isn't that amazing? Wow. You would have found it a lot earlier had you prayed from the beginning. That's what we see in the life of St. Joachim. How would you like it to be humiliated that way? To bring your offering to the temple that always been accepted at that particular time, this time it is not accepted because the gossips have so spoiled your reputation even before the priests, they will not accept it. How would you like that? A great trial like that. What would you do? Either run through the streets and yell and complain, go find those gossipers and throw them by the neck? Or would you go home and pray? Pray, give me some understanding here. Give me some strength to get through this particular thing. Trusting that God will show me the direction and what is going on here. We won't get an angel Gabriel to come appear to us and speak to us like having the St. Joachim and St. Anne, but we will have the light of God's grace to teach us what to do and what direction to accomplish with all these things. There's so many things we can learn from the life of St. Joachim. Just the, these two virtues right here are so important for us and so important for men. These are manly virtues, manly virtues. The love for wives, the fulfilling of Christian marriage as it should be done. Praying, showing the example of prayer in a time of difficulty, leading the family in prayer in a time of trial. Leadership, loving God, all these things, important manly virtues. This is what we see from St. Joachim here, and I, my prayer is for our men to follow those examples and more. I mean, think more about the life of St. Joachim. I'm sure you'll find more virtues to imitate here, but just these two are enough for us to pause and reflect upon on this day and for our men to pray to, pray to imitate what St. Joachim has. Again, I fall back from the beginning of what I'd said. Pope Leo XIII raised the Feast of St. Joachim to this level because he was named Joachim and a great devotion to it. But he also saw that there was something in the life of St. Joachim was needed today. The Holy Ghost inspired him to do that, and here we have these virtues for, to be imitated by our Christian men. My prayer is that you will imitate them. By imitating them, you'll become the saints that God wishes you to be. And after all, isn't that what we're here for? To become saints? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.